Hi, I want to talk today about Aristotle's categories. That's ambiguous between the actual categories philosophically that he proposes and a work in which he outlines them, also called the categories. As you can see, that work is written in Greek, um, and that's the opening page of it. What it is, is in part a philosophical work and in part a grammatical work. In the categories, Aristotle is outlining the basic structure of language, but he takes the basic structure of language as matching the structure of the world. In fact, there's a general methodological presupposition behind this work, which is that the categories of language and the categories of the world match up. We design language and use language in order to represent the way the world is. So it would be surprising, in a sense, if the structure of language had nothing to do with the structure of the world. He thinks that's really where we begin. Now, we don't necessarily end there. It might turn out that in certain respects our language is misleading. But overall, we're going to look at language in general throughout Aristotle for an understanding, not just of the structure of the human mind, which is reasonable enough, but also for the structure of the world that mind and that language are dedicated to describing and understanding. So let's take a look at the categories to try to understand what Aristotle is up to and what the basic categories of language, but also of being, of the world, are. Here is how the categories begin. <clears throat> he says, expressions which are in no way composite signify substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, position, state, action, or affection. He lists those categories as the basic categories, both of the world and of language. So let's try to understand just what they are. He gives some examples, and I've elaborated those, and in some cases updated them to ones that make more sense in English instead of using Greek units of measurement and so on. What is a substance? Here are the examples he gives. Man, the horse, Socrates. Quantity, six feet tall, 235 square miles. Quality, well, these are often called properties. Things like white, tall, angry, wise. Various things we use as attributes of objects in the world. There are also relations among objects in the world. So things like double or greater than or loves. He tends to be fond of mathematical examples of relations, but of course there are many relations among human beings or among things. The book is on the table, for example. Um, or I am speaking to you. Those are relational terms. And then we've got places like at the market or in Austin, times like today, at noon, for a week, positions, lying, sitting, standing, or states like being armed, being puzzled, being impressed. We've got actions like hit, smile, do, walk, thank, and then affections. That is to say, things happening to you to be hit, to be thanked. Well, these are the basic categories, but Aristotle gives you these without much explanation at first. So you can be puzzled. You can think, well, okay, these are categories, but categories of what exactly? Categories of language, categories of thought, categories of things in the world. What is this? Categories of what? Well, that's a good question. What are these things categories of? One possibility is kinds of thing. And of course, substances, like man, or Socrates, or the horse, they do correspond to persons, places, things like that. But on the other hand, a lot of the other categories seem to be doing something very, very different. Loves, for example, or to be thanked, or the relation of being on something, those don't seem like kinds of things. And so if we think of them in terms of kinds of things, we're more inclined to think animal, vegetable, mineral, or in terms of more modern science, element maybe, or compound, uh, etc. And so those seem like very different kinds of categories. Maybe it's kinds of basic thing. After all, we aren't just listing kinds of things. Well, let's see, there are animals. What kind of animals? Oh, there are dogs and cats and human beings and monkeys and gorillas and raccoons and so forth. It's not like that at all, right? So maybe it's kinds of basic thing, the most general categories of things, the most general kinds of things. But again, it's odd to think of relations as things or affections as things or states even as things. So that's a little peculiar. Here is the clue he gives us. And I think it's stated most clearly in the metaphysics, not the same work at all. 
But nevertheless, it helps us understand what he's up to in the categories, and he goes back to that set of categories there in the metaphysics. He says it this way, There is a science which investigates being as being, and the attributes that belong to this in virtue of its own nature. So sometimes people put it this way. Aristotle defines metaphysics, one of the basic areas of philosophy, as the science of being, qua being, the science of being as such, being as being. And that's at first glance a little bit puzzling, but he means I'm studying being, not being hot, being cold, being tall, being short, being wise, being unwise, not that kind of thing, but instead I'm talking about being per se, being itself, being anything, whatever it happens to be. And now you might say, oh, like you can be a man, or you can be a horse, or you can be Socrates. But you could also be tall. You could be thanked. You could be thanking someone. All of those things now make sense as categories of being, ways in which you can be. You can be blank, <laughs> and then various ways of filling in that blank. So here is how we might put it. There are many senses in which a thing may be said to be. But all that is is related to one central point, one definite kind of thing, and is not said to be by a mere ambiguity. So there are many different ways of being. You can be a man, you can be tall, you can be thanked. And those are different senses in a way of being, but they all relate to one thing, he says. And so what is that one thing? If we don't have one thing, then it looks like metaphysics and this entire branch of philosophy is really just the study of a bunch of stuff. But he says, not so fast. Actually, there is a kind of unity to it that may not be obvious at first glance. The kinds of essential being are precisely those that are indicated by the figures of predication. The figures of predication, in other words, are what he takes himself to be outlining by outlining the categories. There's the, there are the ways of predicating something of someone else or something else. So it's a question of this thing or this person can be and then various ways of filling in the blank. Call those the figures of predication. That's what the categories are. The senses of being are just as many as these figures of predication. Since then, some predicates indicate what the subject is, that's substance, others its quality, others quantity, others relation, others activity or passivity, others its where or when. Or Well, being has a meaning answering to each of these. So being is something that is going to vary According to, well, being what? Being a man, being a horse, being thanked, being tall, being to the left of John. All of those are different ways of finishing that. Those are different figures of predication. And they're different ways, then, of talking about being. So we can say, well, all right. They're not really categories of kinds of thing or even kinds of basic thing. They're categories of being. They correspond, notice, to grammatical functions. Almost everybody, when they first look at this list of categories, notices that there is a kind of grammatical structure to these. The figures of predication. That term itself sounds rather grammatical. A predicate is something applied to a subject. And these are different ways of forming predicates of subjects. So look at them again. Substance, man, the horse, Socrates, all of those are noun phrases. Quantities, six feet tall and so on, they're numerical adjectives. Quality, like white, tall, angry, wise, those are descriptive adjectives. Relation, double, greater than, those are relational adjectives. Um, or loves, sometimes it's a relational verb. Then there are places at the mall west of Austin. Those are prepositional phrases. We've got things like today, at noon, for a week, indicating time. Those are adverbs or adverbial phrases. Positions like lying, sitting, standing, well, those are present participles. Then states like being armed or puzzled or impressed, past participles. Actions like hit, smile, do, walk, thank, those are active verbs. And then affections, to be hit, to be thanked, those are passive verbs. So if we think about various categories of grammar, we see they correspond very nicely to Aristotle's categories. That's not an accident. He thinks that the kinds of being are the kinds of predication. And what is a predicate? It's something that goes in the slot together with something else saying what a thing is, what it really is, that is to say substance, or that it is tall, or that it is wise, or it is at the mall, 
or it is happening today at noon, or it is lying down, and so on and so forth. Well, there are many senses, Aristotle says, in which a thing is said to be, but all refer to one starting point. All of these various senses of being relate to one central. Some scholars call it the focal meaning of being. Some things are said to be because they're substances. Others because they're affections of substance. Others because they're a process toward substance, or destructions or privations or qualities of substance, or productive or generative of substance, or of things which are relative to substance, or negations of one of these things of substance itself. So all of these relate in some way to substance. He says all other things are said to be because they are, some of them, quantities of that which is in this primary sense. Others are qualities of it, others affections of it, others some other determination of it. They all, in other words, relate to a primary sense of being, which is substance. So here is how he puts it a little bit later. There are several senses in which a thing may be said to be, as we pointed out previously. For in one sense, being means what a thing is, or this. <laughs> in another sense, it means a quality or quantity or one of the other things that are predicated as these are. While being has all these senses, obviously that which is, primarily, is the what, which indicates the substance of the thing. I think that's an important point. It is really substance that answers the question primarily, what is it? Okay? If someone says, oh, uh, yes, um, you've got a professor in this course, um, who is that? Well, Dan Bonovac is a good answer, right? That tells who I am. But if you simply say, wearing a blue shirt, well, that doesn't say who it is. No, it does describe a relation in this case. I am related to this blue shirt. It attributes a quality to the shirt. It does a variety of things. But on the other hand, it doesn't really answer the question, who is it? And similarly, if I say, aha, I have something in my pocket. Well, what is that thing, you might say? If I say, it's round, that doesn't tell you what it really is. If I say, oh, it's less than six inches, if I say that it is moderately heavy, and so on, you're going to say, well, you know, I, I just, but what is it? What is it? Of course, I'm talking about my keys and a key ring. But all of that is a way of saying, look, um, yeah, to really answer the question, what is it? To give you the primary sense of that and to say this is blah, or that person is blah, I've got to specify substance. I have to give you a kind, I have to give you a name, I have to do something to indicate substance, not merely a quality, quantity, relation, action, affection, and so on. Now, the general point here is that all of the other categories depend on substance. Substance is primary. Everything else is a quantity of a substance, or a quality of a substance, or a relation between substances or a place where a substance is, or something a substance is doing or having done to it, and so forth. They are all of substances. So there are many senses in which a thing may be said to be, but all depend on that focal meaning of being, which is substance. Now what is a substance? I'm going to talk about that in much more detail separately. But at least we can see this from the discussion so far. A substance is a this, something like this man, this horse this place, this key ring, this computer. It answers a question, what is it? Often if we're talking about people, it might answer the question, who is it? But in any case, it identifies something as a man, or as Daniel, or as a book, as a key ring, and so forth. Now, a substance is something that always has that dual character. That is to say, it is a this, it's a particular thing, but it's also always of a kind. It is of such and such a kind. So a substance is always of a kind. This is of the kind, let's say, book. <laughs> I am of the kind human. It has a species, a specific kind, but then one or more general kinds, a genus in Aristotle's terms. So a substance is both a this and a such. A this in that it's a particular thing, but a such in that it's a thing of a certain kind. It is part of a certain class of things, a species, and then even a more general kind of thing, a genus. Well, what is there then? What really exists? The basic question of metaphysics is really the question, what is there? And the answer is substance. Substance is what exists in a primary sense. If we want to ask, what is there? The 
best answer, Aristotle says, is substance. Substance is what there is. But what is substance? Before we tackle that question more completely, we need to draw a distinction. It's a distinction that relates to the character of substances as this and such, of a kind, but also a particular thing of that kind. And it's the distinction between primary and secondary substances. A substance is a this, such, particular thing of a kind. It is also a subject. We predicate other things of it. We say the horse is running or the man is standing. Primary substances are the things that go in those slots most naturally. So they're things, individual objects, individual people. Daniel is talking or the book is on the table. Those are things that uh, we talk about and describe as objects, as things. Those are substances in the primary sense. But we can also talk about the kinds. After all, these substances are this, but also a such. They're things of a kind. And we can talk about those kinds as themselves substances. So I can say, well, that kind of thing is. <laughs> and I'm predicating things of that kind as well as of the individual thing of that kind. So they count as substances too. A kind, a species, a genus, that is something that we can predicate things of. So he calls those secondary substances. We predicate things of kinds as well as of particular objects. Now sometimes we do that by saying the species or the kind horse, you know, is such that blah 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 and so forth. But usually in English we do it by using bare plurals. That is to say a plural noun without any sort of quantifier or determiner or other thing that tells us the extent of what we're saying. So if I say, for example, just tigers are striped, I'm saying th something in general about the kind tiger. I'm not saying anything directly about any particular tiger. After all, there could be an odd tiger that had no stripes. I can say that birds fly, even though some birds, individually speaking, do not fly, because, well, as a kind, birds have the characteristic of flying. Tigers have the characteristic of being striped as a kind. And the same thing, philosophy majors are smart. Well, in this case, I'm attributing something of the kind. Does that mean every particular thing of the kind is like this? No. There could be unstriped tigers or birds that don't fly or, well, unintelligent philosophy majors, hard as that is to imagine. But nevertheless, that's possible. It's the kind we're attributing in these cases and we can do that. So they are subjects. They are substances in a secondary sense. Here's how Aristotle describes it. Substance in the truest and primary and most definite sense of the word is that which is neither predicable of a subject nor present in a subject, for instance, the individual man or horse. But in a secondary sense, those things are called substances within which, as species, the primary substances are included. Also those which, as genera, include the species. For instance, the individual man is included in the species man, and the genus to which the species belongs is animal. These, therefore, that is to say the species man and the genus animal, are termed secondary substances. We can predicate things of the species man or of the genus animal just as easily as we can predicate things of an individual pers person like you or me or Socrates. Well, a primary substance then is what most of our discussion is about. We talk about particular things, particular people. And everything else is something predicable of a primary substance or present in a primary substance. Notice that the kind is something that is predicable of a primary substance. You can say, I am a human being, and that is attributing to me being a member of that kind, human being. And so a secondary substance can be predicated of a primary substance. It can also be predicated um, of, well, maybe other sub-kinds. As, I, you know, as if I'm, I say, well, professors are human beings. I'm attributing that kind to another kind. So kinds can be subjects, but they can also be predicates. That's part of what makes them secondary. Everything except a primary substance is either predicated of primary substances or is present in them. And if these last didn't exist, it would be impossible for anything else to exist. There's one sense in which primary substance really is primary. Why does he call it primary? Not just because we spend most of our time thinking about particular people, particular places, particular things, and so on, but also because Without those, nothing else could exist. Could there be a kind bird or tiger or human being if there were no birds or tigers or human beings? 
Well, I guess, in the sense we have a kind unicorn, even though there are no unicorns. But you might think, actually, such a kind wouldn't really exist at all. In fact, we say unicorns don't exist. And you might think, yeah, that's a weird kind of kind. It's a kind of thing that doesn't exist. And so, really, if there were no substances in the primary sense, there would be, in a sense, no kinds. There would be nothing to stand in a relation to anything else, nothing to have a quality, nothing to do anything or have anything done to it, etc. Well, primary substances, then, are most properly called substances in virtue of the fact that they're ent entities that underlie everything else. And indeed, that's what the Latin word substance means. Substance. It is something that stands under everything else. It is something like a foundation for everything else. Everything else is either predicated of substances or present in substances. So primary substances are most properly so-called because they underlie and are the subjects of everything else. Everything else relates to primary substances. That's what makes them primary. Without them, there really wouldn't be anything at all. Well, I want to close by considering some criteria for substance. What is a substance? Well, we've talked about one already. A substance is a this-such. There are no degrees of it. That's our second criterion. No single substance admits of varying degrees within itself. One man can't be more man than another. I'm a human being. Can you talk about me being more or less human than someone else? Well, no. We're all of the same kind. We're all human beings. Can you talk about me being, well, more Dan Bonovac today than I was yesterday? No. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. A substance is the kind of thing that you are or you aren't. Either you're human or you're not. Either you're Dan Bonovac or you're not. You can't have various degrees of it and have somebody who's more like that than somebody else. Another mark of substance, he says, for our third criterion, is that it has no contrary. That's interesting because qualities, for example, do. Something can be hot or cold. Someone can be tall or short, wise or unwise, friendly or unfriendly. That is not true of substance. Now, in a sense, you can say, well, you can be a human being or not be a human being. True. But there's something strange about non-human, for example, or non-tiger or non-bird. There's no real contrary to substance in the way that there is a contrary to many terms involving quality or relation or other things, even relations, love, hate, greater than, less than, and so on. Substances don't come in those kinds of pairs, and if we construct one like human and non-human, it feels in a sense artificial. It feels as if non-human really isn't a kind <laughs> in a way that human is a kind. Substances do, however, admit contrary qualities. I can be asleep at one moment and awake the next. I can be speaking at one moment and silent the next. I can be moving at one motion and at one moment and then stop my motion and be still at another. And so substances admit contrary qualities. The qualities can be contraries in this way, in a way that substances can't, and substances can have those contrary qualities in a way that the other things can't. Red can't suddenly decide to change today. You say, whoa, red got more red today, or red got a little closer to blue today. It's, it's not like that. Substances don't do this, do this kind of thing, but qualities themselves, relations and so on, they don't change in this way. They don't themselves admit contrary qualities. So, Aristotle tells us the most distinctive mark of substance appears to be that while remaining numerically one and the same, it's capable of admitting contrary qualities. From among things other than substance, we should find ourselves unable to bring forward any which possess this mark. One and the same color can't be both white and black, nor can the same one action be good and bad. This law holds with everything that isn't substance. But one and the self-same substance, while retaining its identity, is yet capable of admitting contrary qualities. Now, I can't be awake and asleep at the same time, but I can be awake at one moment and asleep the next. Red can't be a color at one moment and a relation the next. Let's turn to that basic question of metaphysics. What is there? The part of metaphysics that is specifically dedicated to answering that question is called ontology. And so Aristotle directs himself to that ontological question. What is there? The answer, as we've seen, is substance. Therefore, that which is primarily, not in a qualified sense, but without qualification, must be substance. And indeed, 
he says. The question which was raised of old and is raised now and always, and is always the subject of doubt, namely what being is, is just the question, what is substance? So what is there? Answer, substance. 